super scooters. I just came up here because I opened my notes and it was all scrolled up, so they look like they got deleted. Um, yeah, my name's Hayden, um, Hayden Schaffner. I'm originally from Oregon in the U.S. Uh, anybody ever been to Oregon? No? Oh, Mark has, okay. That's all right. Um, but yeah, but I've been, I've been here in Australia for about four years now. Um, four and a half, if you count my, my DTS, which I did back in Central Training School. Wow. I did back in 2014. Um, did that for six months and then left around the middle of 2015. I was home for a year working, did some, was working at like a grocery store and did some commercial fishing up in Alaska, and then I came back and have been in 2016, the end of 2016, and have been with YWAM since then. Um, what I've been doing with YWAM is staffing DTSs for two years, and then uh, I was leading them as well. Uh, and the DTS, if anybody doesn't know, is our discipleship training school. It's a six-month discipleship course that we offer. Um, if you want to know more about that, you can come talk to me later. Uh, but I don't have time to give you the full plug yet. So, um, but uh, yeah, a lot of, a big part of my ministry over the past four years and being in YWAM has been, like the main part, I guess, has been discipleship. Um, whether that's me being discipled or, or me discipling others. Um, a lot of me being discipled. But <laughs> um yeah, main part of that has been discipleship, and one of the one of the like my favorite things that I've been able to do in the past four years is actually develop like a teaching for the DTS for the school um, that's actually on the topic of discipleship. So um, yeah, so we we have about like twenty different topics that we cover during the, the DTS, um, and one of them is discipleship. And so over the past few years, I've been kind of been developing this, this teaching for this, and I thought it was really cool when Alan left this week, he came and met with us to kind of talk over how the, how the service was gonna go. And he told, me, got, I told us that you guys have been actually doing a, a, like a series on discipleship, yeah? So, Okay, cool. Okay. Um, and so I was really, I don't know, I was really excited because it's something that I've been working on. And actually, two weeks ago, I was teaching on this, on this topic on the DTS that's currently running. So um, I'm really excited to share with you guys. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm really excited to share with you guys. And I think it's cool to that what Alan's been teaching you lines up with some of the stuff that I've been been teaching on recently too. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about discipleship this morning. Um, and I'm going to probably keep it a little bit broader than, than Alan's been talking. I know he's been going through the series of like, I wish you wouldn't have said that or what, what, whatever it is. Um, I'm going to talk about discipleship in a, in a broader context and more of like what it is and how we can approach applying that to our own lives and and helping others in their discipleship journey as well. But, um, yeah, like I said uh, earlier, one of the things that I do, or I used to do, I don't do it anymore, but for about five years I was going up to Alaska in the summer times um, and fishing commercially. And I think I really enjoyed that time up there because it's just an amazing experience to go do that, but it's also made me feel a little bit of a connection to the to Jesus's disciples. Um, one of the reasons why I like this topic so much is because we get to like look at their lives a lot in that, um, and I feel like I have a special connection to them because I I've experienced some of the stuff that they might have experienced, and um, yeah. So so I want to look at the disciples, Jesus's disciples, and and what their relationship with Jesus might have looked like. Um, because I think there's a lot of stuff that we can pull out of that, um, just in the way that they interacted with each other and, and the way that Jesus, who he chose and why he chose him and when and how. Um, 
is really important and there's a lot of stuff that we can apply to our own lives. Um, yeah, so who knows that Jesus was not the only person like that was having disciples in that time. Like it was a pretty, yeah, Mark's raising his hand back there. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> It was a pretty, like, standard thing. It was a pretty, uh, like, that model of a, a teacher having disciples under them that they were, that they were teaching and, and developing was pretty, like, standard back in the culture that, that Jesus was living in. Um, rabbis, in particular, the, the teachers of the, the law, were very highly esteemed individuals in that society um yeah they, they would have been obviously very well versed in the the law and the torah um but they would have been like just highly esteemed members of their communities and and really the the type of people that like everybody wanted to be like and that's why they had like they had such a there was like this cultural thing where people wanted to follow them and, and gain that knowledge and experience that they could from them. I, I would gather in hopes that they would eventually kind of summit and become like the rabbi, right? Um, and I don't think it's a mistake that, that Jesus kind of took advantage of that model uh, when he was calling his disciples to him. I think that he was really specifically like, well, it was just the culture of the time, I guess, but um, I think he knew what he was doing and, and calling them because, and entering into that discipleship relationship with them. Um, not only to develop them as individuals, but also to show us what walking alongside him would look like, right? Um, so, yeah, sorry, I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, the type of relationship that they would have had is not the type of, like, re teacher-student relationship that, that we have with our teachers nowadays. Like, we don't go to, we go to school, or we go to uni, or whatever, we choose our courses, and we go for five, six hours a day. We learn, and then we go home, and we go hang out with our friends, and we forget about it until the next day, unless you have homework. But, um, but these guys were living their lives alongside their teachers. A disciple would live, eat, drink, bathe, travel, whatever, together with their, with their rabbi or their master. And we see this in the way that Jesus walked with his disciples. If you start at the beginning of the Gospels where Jesus first calls his disciples to the very end where he has to part with them in the garden to go get crucified, they're together. Um, and there, you know, there's times when Jesus would send them out to ministry and whatnot, but for the most part, they are constantly walking with one another. And that ga gives the opportunity for so much teaching moments and, and development. Um, one of the things in, that's so amazing about the DTS that, that we run is us as staff or us as the, the leaders of the course, we are, our goal is to help disciple the students that come in and, and help them grow in their faith. And one of the things that's so amazing about that is we get to spend all our time with them and like really pour into them and, and teach. And it's not just in the times where we're having lectures or where we're having like set aside time for learning that we're able to teach and that we're able to, to guide people. Um, and it's the same here in, in this relationship that Jesus had with his disciples. I believe that, that in walking with them that every moment was, a, was an opportunity for Jesus to teach something new to his disciples. Um, one of the, a really kind of funny example that I think is hilarious, actually, is when, when Jesus, they're walking along, going to the next town, 
I think they were walking to Jerusalem. You'll know the story. I don't have the verse with me right now, but, and everybody's hungry, right? And Jesus sees the, the fig tree and there's no fruit on it and he curses the fig tree. I just think that's so f- funny. Like, he just like yells at a tree because it didn't have any fruit on it and they were hungry and it dies. And they're like, the heck, dude? Like, why'd you do that? Uh, and anyway, there's a lot to actually pull from that. There's a lot of good wisdom from that story. But the, my point is, they use that, he used that opportunity where they were hungry and saw this tree that wasn't bearing fruit to teach about the kingdom of God and teach about the importance of bearing fruit in your life and, and being prepared in and out of season. Um, and he didn't, he didn't shy away from like doing this like really weird thing to, to teach that. Um, but they weren't in a classroom. They weren't in the synagogue or anything. It was just out on the road. Um, even the first meeting, uh, when, when, when Jesus first comes to call Simon Peter and the sons of Zebedee to him to follow him, there was a lesson in that, in the, in the catch of fish that they, they got. That, speaking as a fisherman, that catch of fish that they got, I believe was a miracle. Like, they were done for the day. They, there wasn't any fish. They were cleaning their nets. And he tells them to go back out to where they were and, and toss their net in. And they're like, kind of baffled because they were just out there, you know. And they catch this massive catch of fish. And the first thing that, that, that Jesus, the first interaction that he had with his disciples was a teaching moment. He's teaching them how to trust him and how I think giving him them hints as to who he was and the power that he held. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, though we don't walk with, with Jesus in the flesh like they would have, um, you know, I think we maybe have it a little bit better, but we have the Holy Spirit. We have the 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 promise of the resurrection and all that. But though we don't walk with Him in the flesh, we walk with Him in the Spirit. And I think that one of the things that we can pull from that relationship is that we can continually be in a state of of learning and growth with Him. That propels us forward into our faith, right? And, and a deeper understanding of who he is and a deeper appreciation for the things that he's doing in our lives and, and what he's done in our lives in the past. Um, yeah, there's a really good verse in, I have to pull it up. There's a really good verse in uh, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3.18 um, that I think kind of explains this process. The, if the people that were following him were walking with him constantly and constantly growing and learning from him and we who have the spirit are constantly turning our eyes to him and, and choosing to look through, look at every moment through the lens of our faith and our our walk with him. I think this verse really explains that a little bit. It's it's 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. Like I said, we don't walk with him physically anymore, but we do walk with him in the spirit. And I believe that as we as we contemplate him, as we go through our day and, and prayer and as we meet here for worship and as we fellowship with one another, the things that we do that are connecting us to him in our daily lives, those things are those learning opportunities for us. And, and it, we're just constantly being transformed into his image. Some, some, actually this is really cool, some of these, some of the translations for this particular verse actually says that it's like looking into a mirror. It's like looking into the face of God and us, like his 
image being reflected back at us. And we're like transformed by that, which is it's an interesting thought. So yeah, I, when I'm looking at this, this topic, I, I really like looking at the relationship that they would have had. And I also really like looking at who the disciples were. Because in a time when religious posturing was so prevalent and actually something that was one of the main things that Jesus spoke against when he was, when he was doing his ministry, right? He had so much to say about the religious people who were, who were really hypocritical in, in the way that they did things. He had so much to say about that because it was such a, a, a prevalent issue in that environment, he chose to, to go after like the least desirable people um, that you could have think thought of, honestly. Like, it's actually funny, in, in the first account of Jesus calling his disciples in Luke 5, it says that he, they were walking, there was a great crowd that was following Jesus on, on, the, on the lake, and that the disciples that he eventually called were actually like over at the side just like cleaning their nets. Like they weren't even paying attention to him. Like, I, and I don't think they were paying attention to him because I don't think they really thought that they had any business with him. That's more my take on it. But like he, cho he went after the people that, that had no business being a follower of, of a teacher, someone that was, you know, moving in the way that he was. Um, and in fact, they acknowledge it. So back to, in, in this account in Luke 5, Peter acknowledges how unworthy he is of, of following. Um, so they catch the fish, and then this is picking up, uh, I don't know the verse, but it says, when Simon Peter saw the catch that they made, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John's, John, the son of, sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore and, and left everything and followed him. And I think, yeah, it's just interesting that, that they even acknowledged the fact that, that they were not worthy, or at least Simon did. Um, and you kind of see that continue through the Gospels. They have so many times when the religious leaders question what the disciples are doing, um, why they're not fasting, or why they're picking grain on the Sabbath or, you know, why are they doing this, that, or the other? And, and Jesus always defends them, but I think that he chose these people not because, like I said, like not, definitely not because they were the most desirable um, followers, but I think he saw something in them, maybe their heart, um, maybe the potential that they had. Maybe it was just that they were blank slates that were like ready to like receive this new thing that he was bringing. I don't know. Um, but regardless of, of the reason he chose them, he chose them for like a pretty big thing, right? You know, he says to Peter, somewhere along their journey, that he's going to build the church on Peter. And these people not just Peter, but these guys went on to build the church. They went on to, to really lay the foundations for the faith that we follow today. And they weren't perfect. Um, in fact, a lot of times they were arguing with each other. A lot of times they were, they didn't understand what Jesus was trying to tell them. There were times when they acted out in violence against people that didn't agree with them. And and yet Jesus still chose these guys. And he chose to, to pour into them and to, to develop them into what they would later become. 
And the thing, I don't know, the thing about that that I, th I think is so amazing and, and that really like gives me a lot of encouragement when I'm on my walk with the Lord is just how much grace and, and understanding he has for our journey with him. Because Peter wasn't ready this first day that he called him to do what he would later do. Like he wasn't ready at all. And maybe a year later he wasn't ready. Or maybe two years later he wasn't ready. Right? He definitely wasn't ready the day that Jesus was crucified. He denied him three times. I think probably the worst thing that any of them did in their time with Jesus was saying they didn't even know him. And and yet he chose them. And I think that's like Ah, like I said, like, it's so encouraging to me to know the type of people that that Jesus saw something in. Because there's a lot of times when I don't think that there's much to me, and you know, or, or that I'm not good enough to be used by Him, or or like I don't have what it takes to to follow Him. But I believe that He sees something in me, and I believe that He sees something in in all of you guys as well, and that. As we, as we walk with him and as we continue to, to learn from him and apply the things that we're learning from him to our lives, that process like completes itself over and over again. Um, yeah. And as much as there is grace too, I think, how long have we been talking for? <laughs> Uh, as much as there is grace too, there's, I think that there is also a, a responsibility on our shoulders to submit ourselves to that process. Like, when I say that there's grace in, in the process of discipleship and the process of, of learning to be more like Christ, not saying that there's any excuse for us to be like less than we're capable of or to still act out in sin or to be anything other than what he's calling us to be. I guess I just mean that that when we fall short of that, we can always, you know, stand back up and pick ourselves back up. But as much as there is grace, I think, like I said, there's there's a responsibility to to submit ourselves to God's will, to submit ourselves to the process and to be obedient to the things that he's asking us to, to work on and to calling us to or whatever, whatever it might be. The uh, Philippians 2.12 says, Therefore, my dear friends, if you have always obeyed, or as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, this is Paul writing to the church in Philippi. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you and will act in order to fulfill his good purposes. It's not just like, oh, I can do whatever I want. And I, God's got me. I walk with him, so I'm good. But there also is a responsibility for us to honor the things that he's done, really honor the, the sacrifice that he made, um, but also honor the, the fact that he's asked us to, to give it all, right? I think there's a really good, good verse that um, kind of explains that, because it's kind of weird. It's like, I really struggled with this for a while in my early days as a Christian. Um, when I was like five, or, no, I just, um, uh, but I really struggled with that, like, that dichotomy because it was like okay well there's room for growth and room for for mistakes I guess I don't know if that's what you call it say but there's room to be to fall short but they just like also not room <laughs> to fall short and so you're kind of like like what the heck uh, and so there's actually a really good verse here in, in John chap uh, chapter 15 
the vine and the branches, I think, explains that process of, of constantly coming from here to here, from the, from the room for growth to the, the victory. It says, I am the true vine. This is Jesus speaking. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And then down to five, uh, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like the branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches, branches are picked, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. That, <laughs> that verse is so confusing sometimes, actually, because it's like, I'm the vine, you're the branches, da, 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 da. It's like back and forth. It's really hard to, to sort out, I feel. But um, I think it, it describes that process of, of growth and, and like even the, the process of, of pruning, right? So you don't, you don't prune off healthy branches. Like you prune off the, the branches that are not growing fruit um, or, or not, you know, when you're talking about rose, roses maybe, like you're, you're clipping off the stems that you know aren't going to produce a flower at the end, right? And it's the same with here in, in this image of the vine. The, a vine will, a, a grapevine will, will grow out these little sticks that don't produce any fruit. And if you don't cut them off, I've heard a, someone explain this to me once, so this is not my own personal experience. <laughs> but if you don't cut them off, it will continue to grow out to the point where it will actually kill the vine because it's spending so much energy producing a stick. And so you have to cut it off, and, and that allows the energy that the plant's receiving from the soil to actually go to the, the parts of it that are bearing fruit. And, like, it's that process that we go through. We continually, I'm, I gotta come back to this place of just, we're continually focusing on, on what God's doing in our lives. We're continually allowing him to speak to us and to, to teach us and, and looking at every situation in our lives through that lens of like, okay, God, like, what are you doing? Um, how are you trying to grow me in this season? or in this specific situation. And as we allow him to speak to us and as we allow him to move in our lives, he prunes us. And he says it here, you're already clean because of the word that I spoke to you. That word clean and the word prune, as in the branches that don't bear fruit, I'll prune, are the same word. In the, in, when you look into it, it's the process of him speaking to you and allowing that influence into your life and submitting to the word that, that cleans us and that prunes us. And so, yeah, I don't know if I have much more to say than that, honestly. But I want to say, like, my encouragement for you guys today, and I, I feel like this is kind of, kind of basic, but just, Keep allowing him to, to have influence over every aspect of your life. In the same way that the disciples walked with him daily, I don't think that they got much more than a bathroom break apart from him a lot of times. In the same way that they walked with him daily and allowed him to transform their thinking and transform the way that they did life, I think that we can also, in this day and age, through the power of the Holy Spirit, allow that same influence into our lives and, and, and just continue to allow him to transform us. Just like, just like 2 Corinthians says, as we contemplate him, the deeper and deeper we go 
in that process, the deeper and deeper he influences us and, and transforms us. So, yeah. Can I pray for you guys real quick? All right. Yeah, Lord, I just thank you. I thank you that you're, I don't know, that, it, that it's such an easy process that, that it really is just like allowing ourselves to be influenced by you, by, by turning to, turning our focus to you and, and being obedient to what you've asked us. Um, and yeah, I just thank you for the simplicity of that message, Lord. And yeah, I just lift up Arise Church to you this morning and, and ask that, um, yeah, that you would really be taking each and every member, young and old, through that process of, of growth and, and transformation into your image day by day, Lord. Um, yeah, amen.